Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Oh, my gosh, it's such a good turnout. My name is Kathleen McGinnis, and I'm one of the programmers for Shortcuts International. How many short filmmakers do we have in the audience? Not that you're height challenged. Yay! How many um, feature filmmakers? Oh, fantastic, too. They're sneaking in and getting the good skinny. And how many no filmmakers? I mean, you're not a filmmaker. Okay. Oh, sh oh, oh. There's, oh, I know a couple of these. Watch out. So we have an amazing panel for you today. Um, the Shortcuts Connection, Talent Discovery, and Building a Brand. And I'm only reading off my phone to make sure that I actually say it correctly. Basically, what you have up here is an amazing panel of um, people who have been in the industry at different levels for a very long time, but who are actively engaged in helping emerging filmmakers all across the board, all the time, and they're going to have some great insights and interesting things to say. No pressure, but now you're on. I'm going to start at this end and introduce them to you. Rebecca Fisher is a publicist and has been uh, working with emerging filmmakers and at festivals for many years and has um, a special experience with festivals like Seattle, uh, AFI, and Sundance. Jeremy Boxer is with Vimeo, and you guys, many of you have already heard about Vimeo's new um, on online on demand, I'm sorry. Um, a very exciting opportunity, actually, for a number of our short filmmakers here. Peter Trin from ICM, who's uh, always engaged in helping to support new emerging talent and also looking closely at what everybody is doing. And, Mar oh my gosh, Mark, I just, Sletsky. Wow. And I even know him. So that's the end of my relationship with Mark. Um, <laughs> Filmmaker, uh, director, also producer, has been on a number of um, projects. Uh, is going to have some really exciting information and uh, case history to talk about. Sydney Netter, who's a distributor from Holland, distributes short film and documentaries. And very especially at the, not, I know I'm going to say the best of the last, but then everybody else feels left out, so I'm taking it back. Uh, Lisa Ogde, who programs at Sundance, is going to be our moderator today and also will come with a great deal of wealth of experience and information. I'm going to hang out for a little while and learn what I can, but mostly I'm going to let them get started. And thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We're going to keep this pretty casual, so if during the conversation anyone has a question, just put your hand up and this microphone will come and run to you. Um, so wait for the microphone to ask your question. Um, but at any festival, you know, there's a million distractions. There's hundreds of films playing. There's parties every night. It's difficult for any filmmaker to stand out. Um, Mark, I'd like to start with you. Your short, sorry, Rabbi, premiered in 2011 here at Toronto, yeah, correct? That's right, yeah. Um, coming into that festival, did you have a personal branding strategy or like for yourself or the film, or is that something you thought about? Um, I was kind of terrified um, <laughs> going in. And I also was doing like a bunch of, I was like pitching, I'd pitch this, and I was like, uh, so it was basically just like a nonstop panic attack going into the festival. Um, but, you know, I wanted to try and get a little bit of press as much as I could. I know it's hard as a short filmmaker to get any press attention. Um, I actually used to be a film journalist, and I would cover festivals like TIFF, and there's just like so many feature films, it's like impossible to get any kind of press. Occasionally you can get a little you know, nudge. But so really I was just sort of like, uh, I was gonna, you know, I just wanted to jump in, go to as many events as I could and try and meet people and, you know, mm -hmm. smile and seem nice. And did you have a plan even prior to submitting to Toronto? Did you think about which festivals to submit to first or any sort of festival strategy? Yeah, I mean, I thought a lot about that. I mean, obviously TIFF was my first choice to premiere, obviously, and I was like extremely um, anxious about <laughs> getting in, uh, which colored my entire summer. Um, so, and, and then everything else was, was sort of seemed like gravy after that, to be honest, yeah. Cool. And then, Jeremy, you are also a filmmaker. Yep. You had a short The Last Supper that played a number of festivals. What was your sort of approach to branding and strategy? Um, at the time, uh, I had applied. It was my thesis film coming out of college, which was a long time ago. Um, and I had applied to a number of festivals. I didn't know which ones would um, accept me. And I was trying to go for different festivals that I had heard had a pedigree. Um, I got rejected from, I think, 45 film festivals. And then I got uh, accepted to one festival called ResFest, which was a digital film festival at the time, which I then ended up working with them for six years afterwards. But uh, the second festival that I got accepted to was Sundance. And uh, then 
everybody else who had rejected me the year before had decided to accept me. Um, so, uh, but going into Sundance, it was really interesting because again, you're in the same situation as you are here. You're trying to find a way to get your work and get yourself seen. Um, my film was about a, uh, um, it's on Vimeo, so you can look up my account and you can see it there. It's about a, uh, um, six people who go out to dinner and it's all about the lottery. So I printed out lottery tickets. I got, a, I stole a bunch of lottery tickets from New York and put stickers on it and started handing those out as my business cards. Um, and they were different enough. Um, and I also went, uh, uh, for th those were the postcards for the film, but for myself, I ran out of business cards right before I left. And if you don't have business cards at a festival, it's really bad. Um, so there was a business card printer at the subway station and a small picture printer. So I pic put pictures of myself with like a space helmet. It was the only those Japanese kind of stickers that you could get. Um, and so I put that on all my business cards and to this day still people remember that. And so it's like you just have to find things that are going to catch people's attention. You stole lottery tickets? I took a whole bunch <laughs> of like empty lottery tickets. Oh, empty ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. And I'm assuming neither of you used a publicist or a sales no. agent. No. Um, Rebecca, you have extensive publicity experience, and because filmmakers can't often afford to use a publicist, what kind of advice can you offer everyone for standing out in a festival environment? Well, I, is my mic on? It was on. Hello? Can you guys hear me? So I started at Film Festival. I started <laughs> at the Seattle Film Festival, and... Um, and then I worked at Sundance. So I started with the press office within a film festival. So my first recommendation is absolutely make best friends with the festival publicists because they'll be your best friend. As a short filmmaker, it's hard to afford a publicist, but it's good to know what we do. So, you know, that would be, you know, like, you know, network and meet people when you're at a festival, of course you know, easily said, but, you know, learn about what we do so that when you're, fi you know, if your film does start getting attention, you will, you know, know, know people to contact and stuff and work with the festival and make sure that you have really good art for your film, you know, the basics, you know, a website and just be, you know, be ready and make sure you can stand out within, you know, within a million other things. And Sydney, from a sales agent's perspective, um, can you talk about the process of finding the films that you would represent? Does that happen at the festival or before the festival? Yeah, that really depends. It's a, it's a bit of a mixed um, a mixed story. Uh, you know, of course, there are producers that already know they have produced a film or are going to produce a film, and then they just call me and say, well, or email me, and uh, they just want to show me a, a rough cut or a fine cut, and then I say yes or no. More no than yes, usually. Um, well, that's the way it is. You have to be really uh, selective. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do go to festivals and screen films, um, except that, uh, you know, the problem with a lot of festivals is that y it takes so much time. You know, you, uh, in order for me to pick up films, I have to see maybe a hundred films in, you know, to get one or two films that I really like that I can sell. So it's a bit com uh, complicated, but you know, um, what I usually do is I tell people just email me and, uh, uh, with a you know one liner of the film and you know not a trailer because you know it doesn't really tell me anything because if it's a short and you see a, sh a short trailer of a short film it becomes kind of funny in my opinion I mean it's nice to have a little a little glimpse of something and a little um, uh, taste uh, but you know for me to judge the entire film I really have to uh, see the entire film usually so um, you know for me it's really important to go to festivals to show my face um, and you know not my eyes or my my curly hair but you know just to show that I'm there and that I'm working and that I know the people and you know because it's a people's business and you know that a lot of people forget that it's just you know a lot of animators for instance they they uh, they just make their little film and you know they don't do anything after that they just sit there and you know and they put it online <laughs> sometimes and that's not always good right away and I'm sure this is different for every sales agent, but is there anything in particular that you're looking for? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm selling shorts and documentaries. So in the shorts department, I look mostly for funny films because they sell well. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm not looking for drama, 
but my catalog consists of uh, short animation, and that's usually between five and ten minutes, and it can be longer as well, of course. But that's the the average range, um, you know. Glossy glossy films. I'm not so much into the artsy stuff usually because it just doesn't sell very well. Um, that's the animation. Then I do a lot of gay and lesbian short films as well, um, and gay and lesbian documentaries too. Uh, and then I do, yeah, you know, just a regular. Um, drama films too, except that I'm really, really picky about those because there, uh, you know, there's so many ma made out there, too many in my opinion, um, and you know they're n they're okay, but they're not always very sellable. So on documentary, on the documentary side, I usually look for gay and lesbian stuff too, but it has to be a really special angle. I'm not looking so much for things that you know. There have been many films made on transsexual, uh, yeah, transgender, transsexual film. Um, Filmmakers, for instance, who turn into a straight person or something, you know, that's not gay. Um, <laughs> this is a weird uh, thing of, to say for me, but anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm looking for usually funny angles as well, or, or light angles, if, if it's a heavy subject, because, you know, those subjects can be heavy. So a different approach usually, and, you know, I have a lot of documentaries on, on, film on um, filmmakers. Sorry, I'm... Uh, Actors from you know the Hollywood, uh, old Hollywood era uh, sell those as well, and you know anything that's special and well shot. Yeah. Cool. Um, and festivals are always thought of as talent discovery. Peter, for you, how can filmmakers attract agents' attention like yourself? Well, I was going to say, can you can you guys hear me okay? I normally don't sound like a monster like this. I lost my voice a couple days ago, so sorry if I sound scary. You know. Um, but I was going to say, like, you know, being at the Toronto Film Festival or at one of these major fil film festivals, agents, we look at it as filters because essentially they're, if you wanted to be gone every day of the year, you could be gone every day of the year at some various festivals, Scouring Tower, and looking at new films, or whether they be shorts, features, or TV length, or new media type like projects. And the reality for us is, like, you know, being at Toronto, being at Sundance, for example, just to name a few f festivals, is a great way for you guys to, you know, be at a filter where most of our company or most of the major companies are here, essentially looking for ta new talent. And while oftentimes it's it's a business of relationships, so you know how do you dis how do you distinguish yourself from like sending a, a cold email to like an agent? So you have to look at it and sort of strategize from the angle like if I have a friend who's an attorney in the business or if I have a friend who's a you know represented somewhere can I access it through that way and so those are some of the various different ways you can sort of strategize to to stand beyond the the crowd that's been accepted because I mean you got to applaud yourself you've been accepted into a great festival and now what's the next step so and Mark after your film played Toronto you then put it online it was picked as a Vimeo staff pick, and then that's when you started to get some attention. Is that right? Actually, so that that first film, uh -huh. so I made that, and that oh. played a bunch of festivals. And then I made a second film, which was actually sort of through TIFF right. via its uh, Emerging Filmmakers competition thing. And that film, The Decelerators, um, played at a bunch of festivals for about a year. Um, and, you know, I was happy with its festival run. And then at one point, the um, uh, composer of the soundtrack, who's a electronic musician named CFCF, mm -hmm. he had taken over... Uh, he was, you know, he was uh, running this uh, MP3 blog for a day called Gorilla vs. Bear. He was sort of guest curating it, and he said, I'd love to show the film. And mm -hmm. so I thought about it, and it had been about a year or a year and a half of, of festival stuff, and I thought, okay, I'll, you know, maybe now's the time to put it online. I'd love to get more people to see it. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and uh, uh, it was, a, you know, in hindsight, it was a really great decision because then it got picked up by BuzzFeed and by uh, io9, and it became a Vimeo staff pick, and... Uh, uh, it was, you know, just a super great experience because I got, you know, 100,000 people saw it in the first few days. Um, I ended up getting uh, some calls and ended up getting management out of it uh, and representation. So it was, um, you know, putting a film online is definitely, uh, you know, with in like the first few days, honestly did more for me than any festival that I'd ever been to <laughs> and, and years of, of festival sending and going and stuff. Right. Jeremy, can you talk a little bit about the Vimeo staff pick curation, like how sure. that works? Um, well... One of the things that we talk about at, uh, at Vimeo for Staff Picks is trying to make, make kind of the uh, feeling of a festival every day. We pick a handful of films that go uh, live every day uh, throughout the course of the day and different films at different uh, points of the week as well. 
Um, what we're looking for is films that are uh, aspirational, that are really well done, but not necessarily the slickest, most polished film. It's more about the idea that's behind it. And we are looking to expose uh, to our audience um, and uh, um, like the talent that we, that we see on the site. Now, because we're also a service that provides you with storage for your films and ab ability to share private links, I'm sure many of you have done that in terms of getting into festivals. Think about all the other people who are doing that as well, who are our audience. So our audience consists of the industry. So the industry, like everybody, when they get a Vimeo account, their feed is uh, populated with staff picks as one of the first things that they see. So everybody in the industry who uses this site gets to see staff picks. And so what you do have is um, now we've matured staff picks by pushing uh, the envelope in terms of making sure that all the right people know about about it. And so you can pretty much within a week, if you're staff picked, get 100,000 views. So 100,000 views by the people in the industry is, is a lot more powerful than you think. And we've had at least, um, Jason told me that we've had at least 20 films that have gone in the past couple of years from a, a staff pick into development for a feature. We've had a number of other films that have gone from that um, into like management or to things like that have happened to um, like we just heard. And so what we, what we think is really important about staff picks is the right audience and the number of, uh, of people who get to see it versus kind of smaller compartmentalized um, uh, views at, at festivals, which both of them have a huge impact on your career, but it, it shouldn't be a choice of one or the other. You should figure out how to do both and at what time. And how do you guys find those films? Are you scouring the internet? Are they submitted to you guys? Um, every which way you possibly can imagine. Um, we have uh, tools on our back end. We also have, there's, uh, I think at the moment, there's four or five curators on staff picks at the moment. And they all have their own feeds from different places as well. Um, we have, um, and we get emails all the time. And so, the other thing that we did um, a couple years back was we created our uh, Vimeo Festival and Awards. Um, that was to kind of create like more like a supercharged um, uh, approach. Um, and we can talk about that later because that's a different topic. Can I, can I ask you something? Sure. Are you only looking for new shorts usually? Um, no, um, usually it's, it's new shorts. I mean, we, uh, we like to see new shorts. And, uh, but occasionally if we find something that uh, is an older short but has recently been put online, that, that's okay too. Well, I mean, with the internet, there are just as many distractions as a festival. What sure. do you think makes the difference that someone like Mark can draw attention and other people have more success than they do in the festival environment? Well, I, I think like uh, you were saying beforehand, it was like, uh, I think someone said that, um, you, you, you were saying that the festival is like a filter for you. And so staff pick is, <laughs> has we created it as a filter for uh, for audiences and that's the same thing with content across the board if you're a feature filmmaker and i was talking to you guys here you're you're up against the weight of film history as uh, as ted hope put it put it because all of film in its history is now being digitized and put online so you're not in you're not really um uh up against the people that are in this room, you're also up against everybody else's for, for attention. So it's all about creating a, um, a position of separation and making sure that you get the attention that you deserve for, uh, for your project. And Peter, do agents use things like Staff Pick and YouTube and to find new talent? Yeah, we, we, we definitely do. And there are various other tools that we, we look at, like um, there's like a, I think it's Viewfinders, you know, they do a top you know, pick, but by the time it gets there, most of them have representation. So we're looking at it before, and I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of things on staff picks that have, that have been amazing. That like, you know, it, it's a great curation platform, so. And Rebecca, do you have any thoughts about the difference between a f like a festival strategy for marketing and publicity versus once someone goes online, does that change things? Um, what sort of advice would you have? Um, you know, I don't, I don't work a lot with um, online, you know, like that kind of mm -hmm. strategy. So I don't, I'm not really sure. It's all kind of new to me. Um, I work, you know, with festival strategy and I guess the main thing is just, you know, know where you want to go. Are you looking to, 
you know, have your film seen by as many people as you want? Are you looking to have this film be your, you know, resume, so to speak, to do, to get, find other work? Just kind of know what your strategy is and know what the rules are for where you want to go. Are you looking to be nominated for Academy Award? Well, know what festivals are good for that, you know, know what, you know, what festivals and what the rules for the Academy are about p being online. Does it have to be, you know, just, just kind of just have an idea of, you know, what it is your goal is. That would be my advice. Yeah, it's definitely important to know rules about online and also premiere status whenever you're submitting to a festival. Sundance is not one that cares if you're online or not. That would not disqualify you, but a lot of festivals do and any awarding bodies like the Oscars definitely do. Um, and Sydney, and that can just, affect sales, right? If yeah, for sales, it's also uh, sometimes a problem if your if your film is online, especially if it's a new film. Um, you know, I cannot. I'm from Europe, as you all heard, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, online means usually that you can see it everywhere in the world. Um, so the it, it you know most of, most of the time I, I'm selling those films exclusively to the sort of old channels like Canal Plus and Arte in France and some other channels around the world. Uh, Italy as well, and they all uh, want the film exclusively. And you know, the minute you put it online um, without a password, uh, everyone can see it. And I cannot actually sell the film anymore. I mean, um, you know, there are always exceptions to the rule, but most of the time, I cannot give those uh, TV stations an exclusive uh, window, and that's uh, really uh, complicated. And you lose money that way too. I mean, I'm not saying that you're going to earn millions, but you know, a hundred here, a hundred there times your, the m minutes of your film. Um, and sometimes it's 400 or 500 euros a minute. Uh, then it, you lose money out on, uh, on that. And that's really sad. And, and especially also for, uh, you know, some festivals. So there are a couple of festivals in Europe and they don't want you to show the film online first. So, uh, you know, and then you miss out on that. And, and, you know, the smaller festivals, you know, don't care about those. But if you're, if I'm talking about bigger festivals like Berlin and Cannes, for instance, they all want exclusivity. So, you know, because you can win a prize. And if you win a, an award, then it means your, your film is worth more for a lot of other people. Your, people, your film gets uh, in the spotlight better. Can, like yeah. the, the, the one thing I would say is like, how, ma how many of you understand when we say windowing? Does there, does everyone understand, or how many don't understand? Okay, so windowing means like the strategy of when you release your film on uh, a certain platform or uh, through a festival. So like you have different windows which are uh, times of uh, exclusivity that you grant a festival or you grant a TV station or you grant uh, having it online or anything along those lines. And those are different for shorts than they are for features. So in terms of uh, what we were just talking about now, if you want to, uh, you can have a strategy that will say you will take a festival run for a s X amount of time and then potentially try and get your work sold. But if it doesn't work at that point and if you haven't p got picked up, then you can decide to have it online to have the exposure. Or there are other films that we've seen recently that have come out of a festival, have won a festival, like we had a film that won Sundance or got a special jury prize at Sundance and then went on our VOD platform or on the on-demand platform the next day because they reached their height of what they thought that their press would be and they released it and tried to sell the film. So on Vimeo now you have the choice of going free or sold um, and you can choose where in the world it's available. So for example, if you guys are working together and, um, and he sells, uh, you said like you sold mostly to Europe, right? Um, no, I sell to iTunes as well, for instance. So okay. So, so let's say that you've sold uh, Canada, US, France, Germany. You can lock those territories and sell to the rest of the world. So you have that flexibility of reaching your audience. And usually when your film is being sold as a short film, it's looked at differently than if it is uh, being free online in terms of festivals. That's, that's case dependent on different festivals. But it, again, it really depends on what you want to do. If, uh, short films are not usually the uh, way that you're going to make a lot of money. You sometimes can make some money on, on short films. But the majority of the time is to get you to the next level to get you to the next type of film, the next short film, the next whatever you would like to do. So it's all a matter of you trying to figure out what is your path and knowing what's next. When you come, 
when you come to any festival, and it's one of the things that I didn't know when I went um, into my festival run, I didn't know what I wanted to do next. And that was the number one question that everybody asked me. What do you want to do next? Do you have a feature script? Do you have this? Do you have that? Um, it's really, really, really important for you to focus on that more than anything else now that you're here. Yeah, I think you still have to be careful with what you're saying because with the VOD stuff, uh, even though you block it for a certain t uh, territories, there is always a bunch of people who can see it anyway by unblocking it. And well, I mean that's the same thing as if you're selling something for iTunes too, right? So the, you, you can you can unblock. Yeah, you can but unblock iTunes is a shop. It's different. So so Vimeo on demand is a shop too, where you can sell your work. Yeah, okay, but it, yeah, that's true. So yes. why don't we talk about some of the sales options? So there's iTunes, there's, you're talking about selling to television, I think, Canon Plus. Um, there's yeah. now Vimeo On Demand, and there are other options. Peter, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. I mean, there's, I mean, you, there's straight to portal, like, meaning, like, you, know, you guys can have your own, like, direct portal where you're using, you know, wh whether it's Vimeo or Yekra or VHX to you know, s sell directly to consumers pretty much. There's, if you're screening at certain festivals, they can grant you screening fees, you know, for example. Um, but essentially, like, at the end of the day, like, there's two agendas when you make a short, right? And he, he, he brushed on it very well. There's the uh, economic agenda, like, what you want to make out of it, right? And then there's the professional agenda, whether what you want to do next, really, right? And it, is it the right time to get representation who you're gonna? Who are you going to seek out or strategize about getting that representation, right? So oftentimes, I I see shorts as resume builders. So you're looking at it from the professional angle. You can make like you know some money, like we all just said. But the reality is, if you know, you make a great short, you move on to the next short, or you make a great short that you think is a great idea for a feature. So if that's the case, then that that feature script should be already getting written so that when it premieres at a major festival you're like hey uh you, you all of a sudden get a call get numerous calls from agents managers publicists what have you attorneys and you're like actually i've got a feature version of this i want you to read it and lo and behold it's a great version of it and all of a sudden it's set up at a studio afterwards so cool um, I, this is a question for all of you guys. What do you think about the online platforms monetizing? Do you think people will pay to watch short films or purchase them? Um, honestly, I think it's hard enough to get people to pay online to watch uh, feature films, to pay for even their favorite bands, like new album. I, I, I think it w you know I would always put my shorts online for free because I think um, it's to me personally I think it would just limit the audience too much to make them pay even like a dollar. I feel like that's too much of a, a gateway. Um, I would. I think the, the publicity, and especially, as you guys have been saying, um, I think with a short film, like you really do have to think about the professional angle. You have to think about where it's going to take you. And uh, I think the advantages of uh, getting it out to, s to more people and more people in the industry, uh, to me, would supersede the dollars I would make from it every time. But I, I want to say something about that, because you're basically devaluating your film. Because you made it with, you know, you, uh, the making a film costs money. And selling, uh, you, um, what I want to say is that if the, um, if you have a, the, f the film has a value and you're, you know, you're just giving it away for free, basically. So, I mean, but, but, uh, but the value I get from, you know, uh, getting representation or getting my feature idea out there, to me that's more valuable in the long run than $500, $1,000. I mean, the, re the reality is that agenda is made behind you guys. Y you guys have, hey, economically I spent, or like my financiers and myself spent this much money on this specific short. Do, do we want, what's more important, recouping it and making premiums or recouping it and getting it to this point and then at that point, hey, let's go out free so that we can have the world see it and hire us for, to do other things. It's really a personal choice, mm -hmm. right? Can I ask how many documentary short filmmakers are in the room? OK. Um, documentary shorts are a little bit different, I think, than um, I, I know. Sydney, do you sell documentary shorts usually or not? Really? Um, usually not, but a few okay. here and there. Yeah. OK, so uh, with on our on-demand platform, what we've noticed, and it's something that we didn't expect, there are times where documentary shorts do really well and sell really well. and. Um, one example is a film uh, that was made about sriracha, the hot sauce. Um, and the guy made uh, the 
uh, the short film about uh, about the hot sauce, how it was made, and he specifically targeted all the different food blogs, all the different ways um, that people who are massive fans of the hot sauce um, to see the film. And what int what the interesting thing is, because of our uh, on-demand platform, the trailer of, of your film and your film are bonded together. So this was a less than 30 minute film that was being sold for $5 and was sold internationally. And it happened to hit exactly when uh, what is called in the States, the Sriracha apocalypse happened, where Sriracha just was off the shelves and everybody was writing about it. So everybody embedded the trailer for his film and sales of his film skyrocketed at that point in time. It really just depends if you want to sell your work um, directly to your audiences, the most important thing that you need to do is to know your audience. And so that's a completely different mentality than um, looking at trying to get exposure. But if you do have a distinct audience that you know will like it, if it's a, about a band, or if it's about a specific product, or if it's about um, a cause, documentaries have inbuilt audiences. So it's interesting to look at that as a different alternative for you too. Mm -hmm. And Vimeo also has a tip jar feature now, yeah. right? Can you talk about that? Sure. Tip jar is a scenario where you kind of get the best of both worlds. So the, uh, in essence, what you do is um, the on-demand side of things is a paywall. So you are asked to pay before you see something. Um, tip jar is a ability for you to have the exposure to however many people you who get to see your film, but they can also post give you money or before you, they see the film give you money and it is more like a tip to the cu uh, creator. So it kind of sits in that similar world that, um, uh, that you can show your appreciation. So there have been so many times that I've seen short films that I've wanted to help that filmmaker out in some sort of way and so that's why we developed that. Um, let's go to some questions. Let's see if anybody, we have a question right here. Here comes the mic. Um, uh, Mark and Jeremy, uh, when you guys were having your films in festivals, um, how long were you literally paying to put or just putting them in festivals? Was it a year where you were just picking and choosing or did you put them in festivals all at once and just kind of sit back and wait to hear? Yeah, I sort of did like a big, um, you know, maybe three or four months of put, like paying them to put, the, put them in festivals. Then I sort of like let the chips fall and see where I got into. And then I, I got some invitations after I played at a few festivals. And at a certain point, I was like, I, I can't spend any more money on this. I'm broke. Yeah, uh, I had like a specific budget that I had put aside for it. Um, but I had applied to, I had my three key festivals that I wanted to get into. And I had applied to three of them. And uh, I got rejected, like I said, to two of them ahead of time. And so, it, you know, at, at a certain point, you just have to, um, like, you, like you said, just let the chips fall where they may, but just um, have key points of, of where you want to get it in. Right here, here comes the mic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so my question is regarding a point uh, that uh, Mr. Trin made about um, moving from a short to a feature having a short in this festival or another major festival and then having a feature based on that in development, being that this panel is about branding and developing a brand, what's the best way to sort of ride the wave of the success of a short to then promote a feature that is in the works? Um, can I, I'm going to use an example. Okay. So how many of you guys have seen Curfew? Curfew, uh, about, I think, Two, won the Academy Award two years ago, so just short. Um, my, uh, I got a call, I think, around uh, the holidays, like a, several years ago, and it was from one of my friends and one of my clients, Paul Wesley, who is one of the stars of Vampire Diaries. And he was like, hey, um, have you seen this short? I'm like, actually, I have, because it's floating around secretly, and everyone's like, wow, it's fantastic. And I'm like, oh, I love that short. He's like, well, secretly, I'm going to get involved in the feature. I'm like, great. So we're talking about packaging now, right? And I was like, okay. He's like, I got to sneak you the script. So over the Christmas break, I read the script. I'm like, this is great. And we're sitting there, we're strategizing. And I was like, well, we should wait for the Oscar, the Academy Award. Because I think what will happen is they'll shortlist. And then sure enough, it's shortlisted. 
And then I was like, well, let's keep waiting because we, we shouldn't show the script around until we, we figure it out. Then it got nominated, right? And I'm like, okay, now is a good time from a strategy perspective to like get ride the wave, continue to ride the wave and get it out to key financiers and producers. So we went through all the producers that, you know, I thought might be right for the film, um, all the financiers that might be right for the film. And then we s summed it down to probably like, I think it was like 10 to 20. I can't remember because, you know, I'm an old man. Um, but uh, so we sent it out. Um, we had a, t a ton of meetings, obviously. Um, and uh, months later, right after, you know, still a strategy perspective. And I was like, well, let's wait for the Oscars. Let's see if we win. And then all of a sudden it won. And I was like, okay, thank you, <laughs> you know. And uh, then it created even more heat for the script, where now all of a sudden I was getting a ton of incoming calls too, because er people were starting to find out that the script existed. And then I negotiated a deal with a high net worth individual, right, uh, to finance it, because I looked at my client's uh, objectives and agendas on like making this film, and for Sean Christensen, who was a filmmaker at, the, you know, for the short, he wanted certain things like creatively, you know, we want to protect that. And we got the young girl again uh, to play that role. We got Sean played the role that he had played in the short. Paul played a role. We went on and packaged Emmy Rossum onto it too. And then, then it started from a strategy perspective for festivals. So then we got into South by Southwest. It ended up winning the audience award. Um, it just played at uh, the Venice um, Days you know, the section of the Venice Film Festival. And um, we also sold it to, you know, IFC. So it's been a writing, from a, so from a writing away perspective, every project is different. And it's really like, once you figure it out, like you can see how like you're gonna time things together. And for me, th I thought that that was the way to do, you know, and it sounds strategy. like the key to that was your relationship with the actor initially. Total relationship. And I, the funny thing is, like, for example, Paul, I had known Paul personally, you know, personally before he was even a client, right? And so, you know, when he became a client, I was like, oh, Paul, you know, I've met you casually out, you know, at certain events or like certain festivals and that such. And so one of the, one of the most important things that I don't think we've really brushed upon is like, you're at a major, major, major North American film festival. And chances are, um, you know, I, I, I'd take this bet any day that several of you are probably end up working together on certain things, right? Absolutely. And, and you're going to make something that's so fantastic that, like, you know, you're going to go, like, I, I need the agents to stop calling me. How do they know, wait, how do they know where I live? How do they know, wait, how do they know my travel itinerary, right? <laughs> and you're going to go, whoa, right? Because I think oftentimes, like, you know, some people, like, will say, hey, I got into Toronto. How do I get representation? That's like the next question that they have, right? And it's like, how do I get my next thing made, right? So if representation is in, you know, the plan of that, great. If it's not, then like, hey, how do I go on to the next thing? Because unfortunately, as much as like, you know, the major agencies would want to represent everyone, it's, it's not possible. Right. Right. And I think Rebecca mentioned this earlier that it's a people business. It's about meeting people, yeah. talking to people, and especially with agents and programmers, like we get to learn your guys' taste, you guys get to learn our tastes, and we pass stuff around. We, we talk to Sundance all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, and we talk to Toronto all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a, that's another thing that, you know, I don't think we brushed upon, but, you know, just to mention is look at the people that you want to be represented by and see who they represent, see what they've done, see, you know what they've been involved in because then you know you're sort of curating yourself too because taste unfortunately at times is subjective so you know if if there's a certain agent or manager that you've always been rep wanted to be represented by but that person you're a drama director for example and that person just represents a ton of action directors i don't i don't know if that's the right fit right so mm -hmm. So like, yeah, the, 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 you guys are also in an incredibly lucky time period to, to be filmmakers in your position because a lot of this information is online and you can find a lot of information. And also being in the festival, you have access to a lot of different things like names and phone numbers and email addresses of most of us that are on the panel are gonna be listed somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so just take advantage of that and like you said, it's like 
get everybody's uh, who is in your group of filmmakers, get everybody's name and number, mm -hmm. because you never know what's going to happen. Coming out of film school, the the first thing that my professor said, he gave everybody a black book and got everybody to write everybody's name and number in. It was before mobile phones. That's how old I am. Um, so you, um, we were able to, I, and I was hired by, I would say, 60% of the, um, uh, of my hires outside for the next four years were from film, film school people. And you know, I got involved in the film festival circuit from just going to uh, a few different film festivals. And there are friends of mine, you know, like Shane here from, uh, from TIFF. He and I have known each other for 14 years or 12, 14 years from going at from different events and in different jobs. People switch and you never know who is going to be in the room who is going to give you your next shot. You really don't. Yeah, I think he all of us. He lures have. you into this one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think all of us have stories about, you know, we met someone in a film festival that led to another job or we started out as volunteers or we've worked with people we've met in various places. So it's really great. Um, more questions right here? Thank you. Speaking of who's in the room and who, who will give you your next shot, I have a question for Peter. I'm part of TIFF um, as an actor, and I uh, was wondering if it would be possible to meet with you after to discuss representation, <laughs> or if you have any availability. I know during the festival we'll be like, really busy, but if there's any way I could I'm totally fine you. to say hi to you guys afterwards okay. and you know, to chat with you guys and strategize, strategize with you guys. Um, so just, you know, I'll be here for a little bit afterwards. And there's a question over here that I've missed a couple times. Hey there. I have a, a strategic question. So we're, we're a mid-level um, indie film, and this, I guess this question would kind of uh, go more to Rebecca. Um, how do you feel that crowdfunding affects the branding? Um, and what I mean with this question is we're, like the decision that we're trying to make right now is, you know, we've gotten our budget for production, we're in production, we're almost through production, and we've decided to self-distribute, at least in the United States. And so we've gotten to the point where we want to start to raise funds, and so we're wondering, should we go back to our investors to get that distribution budget, or should we have like an Indiegogo campaign or some type of crowdfunding campaign? Um, and the reason that I bring up this question is that my other hat is I used to work for Kayak, um, and you know, and the yeah, the head of the head of Kayak has this incubator in Boston, and at least in the in the tech world, when people are looking to you know to kind of pick up like different you know different tech projects. If there is, you know, if something is crowdfunded versus, you know, getting venture capital for that, a lot of times, you know, in, in the back end, they don't take it as seriously. And so I'm wondering if the same thing works for, if the same thing, you know, kind of applies to this film that we're working on right now. Is our film going to be taken seriously if an Indiegogo campaign is kind of associated with it? Um, and so, yeah, and I, I think that probably other people would have that, that question as well. That's a really good question, and I, I, it, it's case by case. It depends. If you have um, a known celebrity, I hate to say it, but a celebrity or you know somebody like that um, that has a you know, or somebody with a huge following that can kickstart you. You know, I'm using it as a, you know, but you could you could start getting a following, and that can already elevate your film, your campaign later when it gets made. So it's just a case by case ba basis. So if you, you know, just however it's going, if you have, you know, some known commodities already, go for it. Go for it. Get it out there. See if you can get people to pitch in. I mean, that that whole like Veronica Mars thing, how that got done, that was like awesome. But they already had like a no, you know, a show, and they had like a lot of stuff going on, and that was a success story. There's also a lot of stories out there of people trying to do the, you know, a go-go thing or a Kickstarter thing that are completely failing because nobody cares, you know. So it's just it just depends. If you have some momentum, go with it. You know, if you don't and you have financiers that are interested, you know, go that route. You um, know, I, I'm doing a panel um, right after this, a, a whole workshop based off of direct distribution. So. If your aim is direct distribution, I would sincerely encourage you to do a, a campaign. Uh, number one, you'll start to build your fan base, which will then become your audience for your film. Uh, number two, another piece of advice I would give you is do not, if possible, um, give away uh, downloads as part of your uh, rewards. It is not really known as something to do. Most people do, but if you think about it, if you have other rewards that you can give people, um, what you'll end up doing is you'll start to build a mailing list, which when you do direct distribute, you will then be able to sell to those people. 
and those people will be the first people that will want to buy your film because they've invested in your film, and they won't think twice about doing it. So um, we've actually had someone uh, do that recently, and it was incredibly successful for them. So in terms of direct distribution, if your aim is that, start, uh, and if you have all your financing for your production, use it as a way of building a marketing campaign and, and using it for marketing, uh, for getting out. Uh, potentially, you might want to do it, it. You might have goals, like if you reach at a certain level, you might have a theatrical campaign. Um, you can build in all different types of goals. But if you want to talk afterwards, I, I have lots of thoughts on that. Yeah. And I'm going to interject really quickly. If you, if you are making a feature film and you're considering a unit publicist, I would absolutely recommend it because they can help you from the, the get-go with, you know, strategizing and, you know, getting the word out, you know, and, like, pr presentation and website and all that stuff, so definitely. Can I just add that as a, as a former film journalist, um, films that didn't have good photographs taken on the set, I swear to God, the publicity that I would have given some of these films that they didn't get because they didn't have a cover-worthy photograph, it's worth the $500 to hire a photographer for a couple of days. You will make that back like a billion fold in press. Yes. So for all of you, what are the key things for these guys coming into any festival that they should have? Still photography, anything else that you guys want to? Website. Website. Yeah, a, a, a website with like, um, or a simple, or, or, or a press kit or, or, you know, but the number one thing is what you want to do next. Really, that's more than anything else is what you want to do next. More questions out here? Sometimes it's good to have a sales agent too. I <laughs> think it is. How do you well, feel about crowdfunding? Does that affect any sort of... No, know? crowd as much as you like. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't impact sales or he was worried that it No, have because a bad it's uh, pre-production basically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after, after that we talk. Yeah. Well, 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 I was or just going to say, with a sales agent. on a sales agent front, they can be the mechanism that we were talking about when we were talking about strategizing for the long term, right? Because they're going to sit there and tell you, like, here's the strategy for the fiscal objectives, and here's a strategy to heighten up the movie, and then maybe even window it again fiscally, right? Yeah. So if you can do the research and find out if there's certain sales agents, you know, whether it be domestic or foreign sales agents, that can sort of help you to, like, strategize how, how to publicize the film and monetize the film, why wouldn't you? Well, I do that too with festivals. You know, I tell you where to go or where not to go because uh, there's so many festivals around the world. Mm -hmm. And for instance, with this, with TIFF, um, you know, because I'm good friends with uh, with Shane and some other people here in the room, um, I send uh, a film that I knew was going to be prem a world premiere here uh, at TIFF. And so, you know, you, it's nice to know s some of the programmers around the world. I mean, you, as a filmmaker, you can know everyone around the world, of course, and as a sales agent, you can't either. <laughs> But, uh, you know, if you've been in the business for a pretty long time, then you have personal relationships and you can squeeze in sometimes films that you think were, you know, uh, were, good, uh, were, were going to be good for that fest particular festival. So that helps sometimes. And, you know, the good thing about the short sales agent is too, I'm just promoting myself now, is that, uh, you know, if you, we sell packages as well. We don't just sell one short film or, you know, we do that too, of course. But uh, a lot of the the buyers they want pr um, uh, they want packages they want ten films here ten films there five films there. they don't want to they don't want to sign uh, a contract uh, you know five times rather sign a contract once with a sales agent for ten films so that's the advantage of having a sales agent I mean you pay money for that but yeah so what are some common mistakes people make coming into a festival do you guys think that some pitfalls for these guys to watch out for. Besides the lack of stills or no business cards, <laughs> anything else they should I, I be I forgot aware? to bring business cards to this festival. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have no it business cards with me now. <laughs> I don't know about any mistakes. I mean, you know, just be, be yourself and, mm -hmm. and promote Many your people. film. I, I think, yeah, m maybe one mistake, or it's not a mistake, but, you know, what you... I don't see that so often anymore, but in the old days, you saw people uh, w wearing, um, you know, Disney costumes or something to promote, try to promote their film, and that is... Uh, it Was it a Disney-related film? <laughs> I, you know, uh, I don't know how you call those costumes in, uh, in English, but it's like a, a costume anyway, so yeah. yeah. So anyway, that uh, you saw, see that in Cannes sometimes still, but... Um, 
I don't know if it's a real mistake, but it just looks stupid. So, kind of, <laughs> so be wary of going overboard, maybe, in yeah, your promotion. Yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. look stupid. Oh, there's a question right here. Hi. Um, I think my question's probably primarily for Jeremy. Mm -hmm. um, I have a short that's based on a Kurt Vonnegut story. And so we're going to be doing our festival run fairly soon. And we want to be able to sell it and monetize it mm -hmm. if we get into a major festival. You're probably biased on this issue, but Vimeo, VHX, Yekra, what, what would you say are, are the pros and cons? I'm very biased yeah. on this issue because I help build our on-demand platform. So uh, uh, I think in terms of what you want to do, uh, you have to decide uh, which of the platforms is best for you. Um, I can tell you more about our platform, um, but I just don't want it to necessarily be a sales pitch. Um, the important thing that you need to figure out is the strategy that you want to get to and what, what tools are best for you in, in which way. Um, we give 90% back to the filmmaker, um, and we think that that's one of the, uh, the best uh, possible things for us. But also, we have our whole audience. You know, we have 22 million registered users, so that's a benefit that other, the other platforms don't have. There's a number of, like, I can give you a chart which gives you the, all, all the differences of it, but it, I don't want to waste everybody's time here with that. But if you want to talk about it more personally afterwards, we can. There's a question right here. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, so it seems like a lot of your story started with a, a short film or a feature or whatever, but getting accepted into the festival. Um, my question is, when you, when you have a film and you don't get accepted into a festival, whether it's a short or a feature, do you still recommend going to the festivals? And if yes, once you're at the festival, what do you think would be a good way to stand out as a, a filmmaker and to talk about yourself and your project, even though you're not in selected into the festival. So I understand there are a lot of ways to do that online and stuff that you guys talked about today, but this is more related to the be, you know, being actually present at the festival. Um, one of the ways to do it is to basically, if you have a friend that has a film that is going to a festival, um, I would do that because at least in that kind of capacity, there'll be more doors opened to you in terms of getting into events and uh, getting into meeting people. Um, because it's difficult when you come to a festival, let alone if you have a film in the festival, versus not having a film in a festival to get attention by different people. But it's a, it's a matter of festivals are gatherings of people. So um, if you know who you want to reach out to and you know that they're going to be at a festival, for example, you know that there's an actor that's going to be there with a certain film and you want that actor to be in your next film, that might be a, a worth, worthy cause of going there on the off chance or, or trying to meet with that actor at that point in time. It just really depends on what your goal is. Yeah, and it is that would it's a and it's an expensive endeavor. So like if you're going to Cannes and you don't have a film there, it's going to be very expensive. And if you don't have an agenda or know your strategy, I'd say that that's as Jeremy said, the most important thing. Know what you want to get out of it and what you're planning to do, and then perhaps you could use it to your benefit. You could probably make two short films instead of yeah. going to Cannes. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> and as well, like I don't even think you should go to every festival that your film gets into. You know, I think I've seen a lot of people who spend a lot of money. You know, chasing their you know short film around the world as it plays at festivals, and it's nice and it's fun. You get to go to parties, but I don't think you, you know, I think there's like diminishing returns, um, even at, for a filmmaker with a film at a festival. So if you don't have one, you know, I think very carefully about why you should be there. And don't pitch any any of your projects to someone in the bathroom. <laughs> yes, that's it. Or do. <laughs> oh, there's a question down here. Uh, well, oh. uh, I was just listening to point of views that you have. One is then what happens if they don't accept you in, the, um, in any festival. And I don't want to give free the movie because it is true what you are saying. It's your work. But one another point she was saying, many people want to invest if there is a celebrity or there is a good portfolio. So for a new filmmaker, how long can you try um, to get the attention you, you need, like without giving free your work, but at the same time you want people reach you, uh, can find you, your film. So, because you never know who's gonna watch it. 
but then YouTube is too open, and then you cannot sell it to a TV or, or any industry. So can you just explain it, like, how long can you wait, and then to the next step of giving for you? Thanks. Well, from a festival perspective, um, I know it's discouraging when you get rejected from any festival. Um, and at Sundance, we get probably, I think we're up to like 9,000 submissions a year, and we play about 60. So the odds aren't good. <laughs> um, but, I mean, we talk to all festivals. I'm sure Toronto has similar numbers. They have a crazy amount of films they're looking at and not enough room to show things. So I think you just have to apply to as many festivals as you can that fit within your strategy and then also know that I mean films do have sort of a shelf life with festivals they they like them to have been created within the last year or so um, there are all, always exceptions to that but you know and at that point I think you did your festival run and then decided that online is the best place that that you wanted more people to see it so I think it really depends on the project and what you want to do with it I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that well, I usually tell filmmakers, if they start working with me, if you're doing it by yourself, you can make your own choices. But with me, I usually tell filmmakers, wait a year uh, until after we sign, and then, you know, then we talk and see how far, how many sales I've made, and, you know, um, if I can monetize it even more or not. Because it's, you usually need, need like a year or two, at least, for uh, some exclusivity here and there. Uh, but, you know, there are always exceptions to the rule. You know, there there's even... Uh, buyers that buy film because they see it online um, so it works it's a gray area in a way you know it's not black and white um, my point was more like there is different taste and maybe in the festival you are not accept and somebody online really like it and want to do it but if you give it online how can you sell it if it's already free well, can you, you? It, like you said, it just depends on the project. Sometimes that there are films that are online that we've known that um, have been online and then have come off of line because they want to go on sale. It just really depends on the film. And it's like there is no, uh, if you do this, then six months later, then you do this. It, it changes dramatically from film to film. And it also changes daily with all the different tastes and the different people that are in there. It's really a gut thing for you if you're doing it if you've gone through this for a year and you haven't gotten in, got what you want out of it maybe it's better that you get exposure so that you can move on to the next project you know it's just a matter of figuring out what is best for you and what feels right for you I think we have time for one more maybe do we do we not <laughs> do you have time for one more question yeah. okay uh, in the back Um, actually, Lisa, this is a question for you. Um, you're talking about uh, getting over 6,000 submissions at Sundance. 9,000. 9, <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> 9,000 and, you know, accepting 60. So I'm just wondering, um, uh, for you, what is it that stands out amongst those 60? And, or, and not just in the films themselves, but also in the way people communicate to you and everyone has yeah. a different... Um, sort of methodology about contacting programmers or not or mm -hmm. that kind of thing so what is it for you that makes a film stand out yeah I mean I think in general we're looking for new voices and you know something that surprises us and is interesting and well done um, you know I think putting together a program is a little different because like what we all have films we fall in love with and maybe it doesn't fit within the program you know because like we're always like Sydney we're always looking for comedies because we have a lot of dram dramatic content and so we have to balance that with some respect we also show a lot of international films but we are an American festival so we're not going to show you know six films from Finland or something so we have those balances that go in making a program but we talk to all the other festivals. So, I mean, all of us have films that we've fallen in love with that just don't find a place at Sundance, and we'll talk to other festivals, make recommendations. You know, we know other festivals' tastes and try to find all of them homes. I mean, of course, you know, it's, that doesn't mean that programmer is going to love it, but we try to pass on good words. And also programmers work at different festivals, so potentially mm -hmm. what works in one festival might, not, might be better for a different one. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I want to ask you a question. I mean, mm -hmm. do you... Are all the f works that um, are uh, accepted by Sundance, are they all um, submitted? 
or do you guys go after stuff yourselves? Well, they're all submitted, and there is stuff that we track. So, like, we, you know, we we come to festivals like this. We're always talking to people, agents, and other programmers, and we're tracking stuff. And alumni will track that stuff too. But it all does come through submissions and contacts. All right, I think I think that's it for our panel today, guys. But thanks for coming. Thanks for all your wonderful questions. Thanks. I think some of us have to run, but some of us will be here if you guys have questions or just want to ask us anything else. <laughs>